All right, this is the intro for First John. In this series, I'll be doing the letters of First, Second, and Third John. So today, I'm going to be starting off with the intro for First John. All right, so here's some notes on the title from the MacArthur Study Bible, and I'm only going to use the MacArthur Study Bible for this series because there's just a lot of notes. So, all right, so the title. The epistle's title has always been 1 John. It is, it is the uh, first and the largest in a series of three epistles that bear the Apostle John's name. And since the letter identifies with no specific church, location, or individual to whom it was sent, it's in its, classific its classification is as a general epistle, because it's not specifically addressed to a certain a person or a certain church or whatever. Yeah, like Paul's letters were to specific people, like to the Philippians or Colossians or to Timothy or to Titus or whatever. Although 1 John does not exhibit some of the general characteristic the characteristics of a of an epistle common to that time, it like having no introduction, greeting, or concluding salutation. Its yeah, intimate tone and content indicate that the term epistle still applies to it. All right. So that's just some of the background of the title. So what about for the uh, author and the date of the book? So, the epistle does not identify the author, but the strong, consistent, and earliest testimony of the church ascribes it to John, the disciple and apostle. This yeah, anonymity of a... It strongly affirms the early church's identification of the epistle with John the apostle, for only someone of John's well-known and preeminent status as an apostle would be able to write with such unmistakable authority, expecting complete obedience from his readers without clearly identifying himself. And he was well known to his readers so that he did not need to mention his name. And even in his gospel, John, he did not refer to himself by name. He referred to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. So, James and John, yeah, James's older brother, yeah, who was martyred in Acts 12 by Herod Agrippa, they were known as the sons of Zebedee in Matthew 10, whom Jesus gave the name Sons of Thunder. And John was one of the three most in intimate associates of Jesus, along with Peter and James. Yeah, and he was being an he was an eyewitness to and a participant in Jesus's earthly ministry. In addition to the three epistles, John authored the fourth gospel, the Gospel of John, in which yep yeah, he identified himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, and as the one who reclined with Jesus, who reclined on Jesus's breast at the Last Supper, and he also wrote the Book of Revelation. And precise dating is actually difficult because no clear historical indications of date exist in 1 John. So we don't know exactly probably when 1 John was actually written. But most likely John composed this work in the latter part of the first century. Church tradition consistently identifies John in his advanced age as living and actively writing during this time, probably at Ephesus in Asia Minor. And the tone of the epistle supports this evidence since the writer gives the strong impression that he's much older than his readers when he says, my little children or whatever, maybe. In the epistle and John's gospel, they reflect similar vocabulary and manner of expression. 
and such similarity causes many to date the writing of John's epistles occurring as as occurring soon after he composed his gospel so he probably wrote these little epistles after he wrote the gospel of John and since many date the gospel during the latter part of the first century they also prefer a similar date for the epistles and probably revelation afterwards furthermore the heresy John combat, uh, combats most likely reflects the beginnings of Gnosticism which was in its early stages during the latter third of the first century when John was actively writing and since no mention is made of the persecution under, Dom uh, under Domitian, uh, Domitian Emperor of Rome yeah in like the 80 90s ish or so yeah I mean the persecution under Domitian it began under it began around uh, 95 AD so since he doesn't mention that it may have been written before that began in light of such factors a reasonable date for first John is probably between 90 to 95 AD maybe and it was likely written from Ephesus to the churches of Asia Minor over which over which John exercised apostolic leadership all right so that's just some of the background of the authorship and the date but what about the background to the book itself like like what is the book talking about all right so although he was greatly advanced in age whenever he penned this epistle john was still actively ministering to churches he was the sole and remaining apostolic survivor who had intimate eyewitness association with jesus throughout his earthly ministry death resurrection and ascension yeah because under nero all the other apostles got martyred and John was the only one that wasn't so so if this was in the 90s or so then he was the only apostle that was still around and the church fathers like Justin Martyr Irenaeus Clement of Alexandria and Eusebius they indicate after that time John lived at Ephesus in Asia in Asia, in Asia Minor carrying out an extensive evangelistic program overseeing many of the churches that had arisen and conducting an extensive writing ministry i.e. writing these epistles and the gospel of John and Revelation and one church father named Papias who had direct contact with John they, he described him as a living and abiding voice as the last remaining apostle John John's testimony was highly authoritative among the churches and many eagerly sought to hear the one who had firsthand experience with the Lord Jesus yeah and John actually witnessed the uh, crucifixion of Jesus yeah he was the only one that was stuck around because you know all the other ones fled but anyway all right ephesus which you know the apostle paul he spends three years in ephesus and it details some of his time in ephesus in acts 19 and of course he wrote that letter ephesians to the church of ephesus but anyway but ephesus laid within the intellectual center of asia minor and as predicted years before by the apostle paul in acts 20 false teachers arising from within the church's own ranks saturated with the prevailing climate of philosophical trends began infecting the church with false doctrine and perverting fundamental apostolic teaching because yeah paul said i know that after my departure savage wolves are going to come in from among you not sparing the flock to which god has made you overseers so be on guard and shepherd the flock protect them watch out or whatever yeah paul gave that warning and looks like that has come to pass 
So these false teachers that started infiltrating the church, probably specifically the, the church in Ephesus, maybe, yeah, and then maybe other ones around, the, these false teachers advocated new ideas which eventually became known as Gnosticism. All right, I'm going to chase a little rabbit here because I've actually talked a little bit about this before in one of my previous videos. So I'm going to review a little tiny bit of that. It's from my video, Nothing New Under the Sun, where I actually address uh, Gnosticism and how it's kind of seen in a lot of the false religions these days. And that really, it just is a rehashing of the same lies from the garden did God really say, and that ultimately you shall be like God. So, a little bit from the Nothing New Under the Sun notes that I got. In my definition of Gnosticism, I say it is secret knowledge. It's not from the Bible. It's given to a certain few. And, it, and that word Gnosticism, it comes from the Greek word Gnosis, which means knowledge. So, like the secret knowledge that only the elite or the enlightened people can get and pass on. Now, here are some beliefs of Gnosticism. I don't know if this was some of the early versions of Gnosticism that John was combating, but this is some of what I found when it comes to Gnosticism. But some of the beliefs are this, that God, quotations, failed to create a flawless world, but he gave mankind a spirit or a divine spark. And our physical bodies are inherently bad. And the physical world, matter, is bad too. Only our spirit that's trapped inside of our bodies is good. And there's this lesser God that created the physical uh, world and these bodies that our spirits are trapped in. This lesser God, which, have, which I think the Gnostics actually uh, say that the God of the Old Testament could be this lesser God maybe yeah but this lesser God is referred to as the Demiurge and, uh, and then of course today you also have this thing called agnosticism which means you really can't know or have relationship with God yeah it's like the opposite you really can't have knowledge of God or if there is a God or whatever but anyway yeah, but Gnosticism, it's like you can ultimately have knowledge about God or whatever, who you are through this secret knowledge. And sadly, this supposed knowledge emphasizes a uh, higher truth other than the Bible. Well, that's not really truth though, but anyway, only the Bible is true because Jesus said your word is truth. And salvation ultimately would be by knowledge and not by grace through faith. Your divine spirit is liberated from your body in the material, physical world by the secret knowledge. And ultimately, man's problem is not sin, but it's ignorance, ultimately, of who you are and who you can be. You can become, you're a spark of the divine. You got some. DNA, divine DNA you got some God inside you this little piece of God inside you you just gotta figure that out and hopefully eventually you can become that thing yeah and rules are not salvific only knowledge yeah well ultimately rules can't save you nobody's justified by the law anyway but you're not even justified by this supposed knowledge either. All right. And also, with the development of this heresy of Gnosticism in the early centuries, you also had this Gnostic Jesus. And one of these heresies was known as Docetism. And it basically taught this, that Jesus' body was not real, he was just spirit. 
he basically was just this spirit who would come to bring bring us this knowledge or whatever and there was this other heresy called it Synthurian, yeah, Synthurian, however you say that. Yeah, yeah, Synthurianism, however you say that. Jesus was sometimes human and at times divine. So he wasn't always human and he wasn't always divine. Yeah, sometimes he was human, sometimes he was divine. He was never both at the same time, basically. And this Gnostic Jesus brought this secret knowledge. So I guess salvation is only by secret knowledge and liberation of the Spirit, not by grace through faith. And also, in like the later century or whatever, in the second century, you started to get these Gnostic Gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas or whatever. And they were supposedly just lost books in the Bible, but the early church fathers saw them as forgeries. And then, of course, there's the command repeated in Scripture, yeah, to not add to the Bible. Yeah, Deuteronomy 4.2 and 12.32 and Proverbs 30, verse 6 and Revelation 22.18 through 19. And the supposed secret knowledge actually does add to the Bible. Yeah, because it's outside of the Bible. It's looking for truth apart from the Bible. And thus it's taking away or adding to it, which is a no-no. Alright, and then also in this video, I actually talked a little bit about First John. So here's kind of a little summary even here and then I'll get back to the MacArthur summary but I just wanted to revisit this since since this is first John all right but basically first John actually combats Gnosticism with two primary tests to prove that one is a Christian number one you got these moral tests and uh, there's some examples without sin and in Christ that's actually going to be dealt with in the first chapter because these Gnostics were claiming to be without sin. But John's going to refute that. Yep. And lifestyle of sin while enlightened, thus not really Christians. Yeah, you're really enlightened if you love. Love is actually obeying God's commands. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Yeah, you're really in the light. You really know God if you actually love God and if you love his other and if you love his people. That's actually going to be talked about. And the Gnostics are not really of us. Yeah, John says in John the first John two, nineteen, he says they went out from us because they were not of us. So Lord willing I'll get to that in chapter two. And then since matter is bad, then sin in the physical world is inconsequential. So you could pretty much do whatever you want to with your bodies. Even though Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6 that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, so glorify God with your bodies in the context of sexual immorality, but it can be applied to other things too. And John also says you cannot go on willfully sinning if you're a true Christian. Yeah, but since the spirit inside of you is good and this body is inherently evil, then you could pretty much just do whatever you want to. Because I mean, you're basically good. You're basically without sin if you got a spark, if you got the spark of the divine in you or whatever. It's all good. No, 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 no. But those are some of the moral tests. And then the other test that God, uh, sorry, that God inspired John to write were these doctrinal tests enlightened with knowledge you have supposedly having this knowledge the secret knowledge or enlightened or you really know the truth but that's not true and also you're devoted to worldly wisdom and not to God do not love the world or the things in the world and John says do not believe every spirit test the spirits to see whether or not they're from God 
for many false prophets have gone out into the world, specifically these Gnostic false teachers, false prophets, who were probably claiming that maybe God gave them this secret knowledge, but of course, that's not true. Yeah, so you are to test this supposed knowledge. And also, Jesus was not a real person, even though John's going to refute that. Yeah, because John was an eyewitness of Jesus, so he definitely, so John would say, yeah, he was a real person, I was an eyewitness. So you guys, are, you guys are saying it's false. And then at the very end of First John, I think it's the last verse. Yeah, five twenty-one. Little children, keep yourselves away from idols. So, which ultimately would be this false religious system. Stay away from this Gnosticism. Yeah, watch out for it. Test it. Yep. And. If they're denying that Jesus did not come in the flesh, then they do not have God. Yep, and that such person is Antichrist. So, if anybody's saying these types of things, denying the truth of the gospel and who Jesus really is, yep, denying what the Bible actually teaches, because pretty much by this point, I think you... If this was like in the late 90s, you pretty much already had almost all of the New Testament written. So, and Paul actually, and Peter actually did uh, put, uh, seem to say, you know, that Paul's writings actually were scripture because he commended Paul's writings. So you already had probably the reading of these New Testament texts even by this time. So, so in order to deal with this Gnostic heresy, you would need to test it by those texts, by the biblical texts, I guess, up to this point. Yeah, the Old Testament and then what you had of the New Testament, I guess, at this point. Yeah, now of course it wasn't all put together and called the New Testament yet. Yeah, but that would be not. Yeah, but you started to have the books and letters themselves, most of them already written at this point. All right, but that's some of the notes from my uh, Nothing New Under the Sun video, so you can go check that out if you want to. But as I said, I just wanted to revisit that because there was a little summary of First John there too. Okay, so getting back to MacArthur. So you have this false teaching of Gnosticism, and even Paul fought against this heresy. And after the Pauline battle for freedom from the law, fighting against the Judaizers, which there's some notes for that, but I'm not going to go into those. You can go check that out in the video, the other video. All right. So after the Pauline battle for freedom from the law, Gnosticism was the most dangerous heresy that threatened the early church for centuries. And I think Paul actually fought against this Gnostic heresy in a way when writing to when writing Colossians whenever he was defending the deity of Christ and telling the Christians to abstain from aestheticism treating your body harshly and all that stuff so and MacArthur has some notes on that so I'll get to that pretty soon okay but most likely John is combating the beginnings of this heresy that threatened to destroy the fundamentals of the faith and the churches. Yeah. And Gnosticism, influenced by such philosophers as Plato, it advocated a dualism asserting that matter was inherently evil and the spirit was good. Yeah, as I said already. And as a result of this presupposition, those false teachers, although attributing some form of deity to Christ, they denied his true humanity to preserve him from evil. That would be like the docetism heresy. It also claimed elevated knowledge, a higher truth only known to those in on the deep things. Only the initiated had the mystical knowledge of truth that was even higher than that of scripture. And instead of divine revelation, 
standing as judge over man's ideas instead of the Bible standing over judge over yeah over man's ideas man's ideas judged God's revelation and the heresy featured two basic forms it asserted that Jesus's physical body was not real but it only seemed to be physical the docetism yeah which is from a Greek word that means to appear and John forcefully affirmed the physical reality of Jesus by reminding his readers that he was an eyewitness to him he has seen heard handled Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and according to early tradition Irenaeus another yeah yeah Irenaeus according to Irenaeus another form of this heresy which John may have attacked was led by a man named Serinthius where you get that other heresy who uh, contended that Christ's spirit descended upon the human Jesus at his baptism but left him just before the crucifixion and John wrote that that the Jesus who was baptized at the beginning of his ministry was the same person who was crucified on the cross and such heretical uh, heretical views destroy not only the true humanity of Jesus but also the atonement for Jesus must not only have been truly God but also truly human physically real he had to be the truly human had to be truly human man who actually suffered and died on the cross in order to be the acceptable substitutionary sacrifice for sin yeah the biblical view of Jesus affirms his complete humanity as well as his full deity fully God and fully man and the Gnostic idea that matter was evil and only spirit was good it led to the idea that either the body should be treated harshly a form of aestheticism which Paul condemned in, in uh, Colossians 2 or also sins committed in the body had no connection or effect on one spirit so you could sin as much as you want to and it really has no effect since you're basically spirit and you're inherently good and this led some especially John's opponents to conclude that sin committed in the physical body did not matter absolute indulgence in immorality was permissible and one could deny sin even existed and John deals with this in the first chapter you say you have no sin you deceive yourself and as Paul said again glorify God with your bodies yep one could deny that sin even existed and disregard God's law since your body doesn't really matter since you're inherently good you could pretty much do whatever you want to and John emphasized the need for obedience to God's laws for he defined true love of God as obedience to his commandments yeah and Jesus said as I've said before if you love me you'll keep my commandments and a lack of love for fe for fellow believers characterizes false teachers especially as they react especially as they react against anyone rejecting their new way of thinking they separate they separated their deceived followers from the fellowship of those who remained faithful to apostolic teaching leading john to reply that such separation outwardly manifested those who followed yeah manifested that those who followed these false teachers lacked genuine salvation they went out from us because they were not really of us their departure left the other believers who remained faithful to apostolic doctrine shaken where you have some supposed Christians and fellowship starting to follow after these false teachers who probably rose up from among them as Paul warned and bought into this Gnostic stuff yeah but sadly since you had people going astray it probably left the true believers you know shaken and probably what do we do uh, what do we do we got people departing 
but responding to this crisis, this age, this aged apostle wrote to reassure to those remaining faithful. He was reassuring those remaining faithful and also to combat this grave threat to the church. And since the heresy was so acutely dangerous and the time period was so critical for the church, for the church in danger of being overwhelmed by false teaching, John gently, lovingly, but with unquestionable apostolic authority, sent this letter to the churches in his sphere of influence to stem this spread, to stem this spreading plague of false doctrine. Wrote this letter to try to stop this false teaching. Yeah, that was threatening the church. All right, here's some historical and theological themes that are in the book. In light of the circumstances of the epistle, the overall theme of First John is a recall to the fundamentals of the faith or to go back to the basics of Christianity since this heresy was threatening those very things. And this apostle deals with the certainties, not opinions or conjecture. He emphasizes the absolute character of Christianity in very simple terms, terms that are clear and unmistakable, leaving no doubt as to the fundamental nature of those truths. A warm, conversational, and above all, loving tone occurs like a father having a tender, intimate conversation with his children. I mean, he does use the term, my children, so anyway. And First John is also pastoral written from a heart from the heart of a pastor who was concerned for his people as a shepherd john communicated to his flock some very basic but vitally essential principles reassuring them regarding the basics of the faith and he desired them to have joy regarding the certainty of their faith rather than being upset by the false teaching and the current defections of some so basically take joy in the truth that you guys believe in and don't be upset or dismayed by the false teaching and sadly people that are falling for it. And the book's viewpoint, however, is not only pastoral but also uh, polemical, I guess. Not only positive, but it's also negative. John refutes the defectors with sound doctrine, exhibiting no tolerance for them who pervert divine truth. And he labels those departing from divine truth as false prophets and those trying to deceive and even as antichrists. He pointedly identifies the ultimate source of all such defection from sound doctrine as demonic. And the constant repetition of these three sub-themes reinforces the overall theme regarding faithfulness to the basics of Christianity. Yep, some of these sub-themes here like happiness, holiness, security. And by faithfulness to the basics as readers will experience these three results continu continually in their lives. These factors also reveal the key cycle of true spirituality in first john a uh, proper belief in jesus produces obedience to his commands obedience issues in love for god and fellow believers and with these three sound faith obedience and love operate when these three things operate and love together they result in these other three things happiness holiness and assurance they constitute the evidence, the litmus test of a true Christian. Obeying God's commands, yeah, and loving God as a result. Well, that's how you love God, obeying and also loving believers and being sound in the faith, having good doctrine. Yeah, when you have those things operating at the same time in your life, you're, it's going to result in joy, you know, happiness, yeah holiness and assurance of your salvation i write these things and john says i write these things to you so that you may know that you have eternal life you can have assurance of it 
Yeah, and if you have these types of things going on in your life, then that can be very good evidence, the litmus test of being a true Christian or not. Well, if you have those things, it would be evidence that you really are a Christian. If you don't have these, then that could be a good sign that you're not really a Christian. Yeah, and Paul called the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 13 to examine themselves. Well, this book is probably a good one to do self-examination with since it gives these tests to see if you're really a true Christian or not. Yeah, to combat this heresy that was going against Christianity. All right, but there are some interpretive challenges as well. Theologians debate the precise nature of the false teachers' beliefs in 1 John because John does not directly specify their beliefs, but rather combats the heretics mainly through a uh, positive reinstatement of the fundamentals of the faith. And the main feature of the heresy as noted above seems to be a denial of the incarnation, i.e. Jesus had not come in the flesh. And this was most likely an incipient or basically the beginning form of Gnosticism. Yeah, just Gnosticism in its early stages, denying who Jesus really was. And probably some of those notes highlighted previously about Gnosticism from the other video, The Nothing New Under the Sun, maybe some of that would eventually start coming later on. Maybe that, all of that wasn't totally around at this time, maybe just some of it. Yeah. All right. But the interpreter is also challenged by the uh, rigidity of John's theology. John presents the uh, basics or the fundamentals of the Christian life in absolute, not relative terms. Unlike Paul, who presented exceptions and dealt so often with believers' failure to meet the divine standard, John actually does not deal with the what-if-I-fail issues. Um, he deals with those core issues that would show whether you're really a Christian or not. Only in John, second, uh, First John two one, in verse two, yeah, two one and two, does he give some relief from the absolutes. But the rest of the book presents truths in black and white, rather than shades of gray often through stark contrast, i.e. like light versus darkness. Yeah, not, you know, gray. A mix of white and black, light and dark. No, yeah, light versus darkness. Truth versus lies. Children of God versus children of the devil. Yeah, this side or this side. And those who claim to be Christians must display the characteristics of genuine Christians sound doctrine, obedience, and love. Those who are truly born again have been given a new nature which gives, which gives evidence of itself. And John the Baptist said, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Well, this is some of the fruit that you would bear in keeping with repentance, sound doctrine, obedience, and love. And those who do not display characteristics of the new nature do not have it. So they were never truly born again. In other words, they're not Christians. The issues do not center as much of Paul writings does in maintaining temporal or daily fellowship with God, but the issues instead center on the application of basic tests in one's life to confirm that salvation has truly occurred. Such absolute distinctions were characteristic of John's gospel. In unique fashion, John challenges the interpreter by his repetition of similar themes over and over to emphasize the basic truths uh, about genuine Christianity. And some had have likened John's repetition to a spiral that, move, that moves 
outward and becomes larger and larger and each time spreading the same truth over a uh, wider area and encompassing more territory. And others have seen the spiral as moving inward, penetrating deeper and deeper into the same themes while expanding on his thoughts. However one views this spiraling pattern, John uses repetition, repetition of the basic truths as a means to uh, insinuate the, uh, the, their importance and to help his readers understand and remember them. Yeah, you remember things better with repeti repetition. Wanting them, I guess, to remember the truths, basic truths of Christianity. All right, and then the outline of the book itself. And then that'll be the end of the intro, and Lord willing, I'll get to chapter one next time. All right, so the first section are the fundamental tests of genuine fellowship. And this is the first spiral, spiral one in chapters one through, yeah, chapters one through two, verse 17. All right, and then the first, and then, of course, you also have the doctrinal and moral tests in each of these spirals so the doc so you got the doctrinal tests in uh, John uh, the first chapter all the way to 2 2 and then you have a biblical view of Christ in 1 verses 1 through 4 and then a biblical view of sin 1 5 through 2 2 and then moral tests from uh, uh, chapter 2, 3 through 17. And you got a biblical view of uh, obedience, so verses 3 through 6 and 2. And a biblical view of love, 7 through 17. And the love that God requires, 7 through 11. And a love that God hates, is 12 through 17, loving the world. All right, and then the second spiral, test of genuine fellowship, really belonging to God and to the Christian community. The second spiral again, yeah, in verses uh, uh, 2 through uh, chapter 2, verse 18 through 324, you got another doctrinal test in verses... Uh, 18 through 27 in chapter 2. Yeah, you got Antichrist apart from Christian fellowship in 18 through 21, 2. Antichrist deny the Christian faith, 22 through 25. And then Antichrist deceive the Christian faithful, 26 and 27. And then the second moral test for determining genuine fellowship with God and other Christians genuine Christian fellowship and faith. So the moral test again, uh, 2, 28 through 3, 24. So the first moral test there, the purifying hope of the Lord's return, 2, 28 through 3, 3. And then also uh, the Christian's incompatibility with sin, 3, 4 through 24. Yeah, the requirement of righteousness, 3, verses 4 through 10, and then the requirement of love, 11 through 24. All right, and then the third spiral of uh, genuine fellowship. Yep, and then the third doctrinal, uh, doctrinal and moral tests in chapter 4. So, so the first, so the third doctrinal test is, yeah, verses 1 through 6 and 4. And verse, yep, yeah, so. And then the demonic source of false doctrine, 1 through 3. And then the need for sound doctrine, 4 through 6. And then the moral test, 7 through 21. Yeah, God's character of love, 7 through 10. And then God's requirement of love, 11 through 
21. Alright, and then the fourth and final spiral. Yep, yeah, in, uh, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. In, uh, chapter 5. So, 5, yeah. So, 1 through 21. Yep. Alright, the victorious life in Christ, the first five verses of 5. And then the witness of God for Christ, 6 through 12. Christian certainties because of Christ, 13 through 21. And here's some of these certainties. 1. The certainty of eternal life, verse 13, 5, 13. The certainty of answered prayer, 14 through 17. And finally, the certainty of victory over all sin and Satan, 18 through 21. And 21, the warning to stay away from idols, and that's the end of the book. Okay, well that's the intro, and Lord willing, I'll get to chapter 1 next time. But until then, may God bless you, and the grace and mercy won by Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.